Welcome, Achievers, to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of... We're at first. It's a little late. I know. A little late. I had some personal things in my life come up, and I had to actually push the recording. Uh, this is a solo episode. Of course, um, not really solo as I have Kratos with me this week. Uh, ahead of his upcoming God of War Ragnarok release, he decided to join me. He's very quiet, so he might not talk much to this episode, but... I wanted to make sure to jump on to at least get an episode out for you guys and uh, keep myself sharp as I find if I miss a week or anything of that nature, I, I, I tend to, you lose a little bit, right? I always like the additive of just do and you'll learn, right? Just keep doing it and you'll learn more stuff. So I'm going to do this week's episode solo. Hopefully this... Hopefully I can keep your attention as I don't have anyone to riff off of. So it's just it's just going to be me talking about the news. Just like always. So let's start with Not So Rapid Fire. This week, CG Project Red announced they're going to be remaking Witcher 1, uh, the first Witcher. Uh, there's a couple notable things about this one. They said they're going to be using Unreal Engine 5, which tells you a... Lot, but I think that was my puppy. I think she scared herself. Strange. Sorry about that. They're using Unreal Engine 5, which tells me a few things. One, this is obviously very early. This might even be pre-pro. And then two, this is right behind that they did their huge slate of announcements with... They're making another Witcher trilogy. They're making the new C uh, Cyberpunk game. They're making... um. Uh, what was one? There was like another Witcher game aside from the trilogy in these things. So they're going to be very busy. And I did find that some people on Twitter, mainly inside the games industry and maybe some insiders, if you can call them that. We're trying to speculate that the reason that CG is so loud right now with their projects that most of them being in pre-production and barely any work have been on them is they're trying to up their value for but such an acquisition of someone. And they even mentioned sony being one of them and we're going to cover that a little bit more later in the show but i found that first this remake is very welcome as the i don't know if any achiever at home has seen the witcher one it is pretty rough now witcher 2 looks great in my opinion i think that would just need like a little little love and make a 4k and 60 frames that one's fine and then you'll have a whole trilogy of games that people can play together maybe make a bundle or something that would be very nice but I thought it was interesting. I want to bring in everyone's attention. Next up, it seems we got some missing pieces I mentioned last week. Bayonetta's former voice actor, Helena Taylor, suggested she was only offered around $3,000 to return as Bayonetta. It seems to be somewhat false as she has not only walked back that claim and said that that was completely untrue. She also went back on her call to boycott the game and is said to donate to some charities that she had listed in a tweet. Um, I think this was... A little, not, I mean, obvious seems harsh, but when she said $3,000, I was like, all right, either Platinum wanted her to leave, because there, there's no way they actually thought they'd pay her that much, or two, she's not being completely forthright, forth, uh, right with the information that she's giving us. So it seems like she's walked back on all of that. Seems like that uh, she was... Uh, at least maybe misinformed to the situation. I'm curious how it went down. Um, she made some very bold claims and seemingly walked all of it back. So I would be shocked if many game <laughs> her. I would be shocked if any games uh, work with her in the future. As I I doubt that she cares too too much or anyone in her other fields cares too much. I believe she's classically trained like actor, so sh she's going to go. I think she just plays in these things, so I don't think anyone cares about games there, but I think her name might be sullied a bit in the games industry, at least. And of course, that's all for Not So Rapid Fire, so let's go with a question that I will be asking myself this week, and that is, of course, uh, Elijah, what have you been playing? I have been playing quite a bit this week. I actually finished Gotham Knights, surprisingly. Um, I have completed the game. It's actually surprisingly better than I expected, but still bad. You know what I mean? Like, 
it's not i wouldn't say it is a bad video game i've played bad video games this isn't bad but it is definitely not polished it definitely lacks in other fields and what's so frustrating is they get so many things right about the game they get the co-op right which is very seamless they get the lore right which is very nice when you find little pieces of the lore around the city you find little audio logs of Batman with the side quests and things like there's little things they do right and a lot of it is done right a lot of the character dialogue is nice in between them although some of them are bad it's it's you could tell like some people wrote you know like I feel like I can tell like, oh, someone else wrote this. Because I can, like, you see the good writing, and then there's bad writing, and you're like, okay, so, like, this this was scene was written by someone else, and this one was, like, it's clear multiple people were in the room writing this game uh, versus another game where it seemed more, a little more seamless. But I enjoyed the game. I I, I was talking with my wife, because uh, she, she is actually enjoying it quite a bit, and uh, we were talking about, you know, how our experiences is, because she beat it a little bit before I did. And I was telling her, like, you know, I have a lot of problems with the game, and I would love to actually, like, sit down and talk very in-depth with it maybe another time. Maybe I'll make a video about it or something. But I think one of the things that kept me so much is I am never, if at least uh, I will, I, in this present time, won't see it. A game like this in a very long time. I am a huge DC fan going back to when I was, I think, 10. And my dad had a, his comic book collection when he was a kid, and I would look through it, sometimes read stuff, and it was very cool to experience that stuff. Um, but... And I've always loved the Bat Family. I love Batgirl. I love Red Hood. Red Hood I had a huge fucking love for since the Batman Under the Red Hood movie. Uh, I mean, he's one of my favorites of the, like, kind of DC darker side of stuff like uh with and his run of red hood and the outlaws really good too uh nightwing is one of my favorite dc people just because he's fun and i like that he's acrobatic and things and he's got these sticks that he uses a lot of cool stuff and i find myself in the position that i will probably never get a game like this ever again and if i do it won't be for a very very long time once the next time i'm gonna be able to play as nightwing in a video game When's the next time I'm going to be able to play Batgirl? When's the next time I'm going to be able to play Tim Drake? Red Hood? When is the next time I'm going to be able to play these characters? So I'm taking this time with Gotham Knights to really soak it in and enjoy it for what it is and hope that someone picks up the baton later on and makes this better because this experience was incredibly flawed, although there were a lot of aspects I did like. I did like the different abilities, which I didn't think I would. I do kind of like what they did with the suits and transmog system, which is almost perfect. They just messed up at the very end with, with certain aspects of it. I do like the dialogue between each other. I do like the different narratives that you get if you put different people in different scenes. Uh, it's not incredibly different, but it's a little different. And it's very nice. But I've talked enough about Gotham Knights. I don't think I can... Uh, I don't want to bore anyone at home, as Gotham Knights clearly is... Not the most interesting thing to talk about. Next up, I want to talk about Call of Duty that launched twice, technically. It launched uh, the campaign, which I talked about last week. I don't need to go into it more. I did finish it. Very good. Campaign was very good. I, I think it might be my favorite campaign of all. Although there seems to be divisive as there's people that don't actually like it that much at all. There's a couple people that do like it. I think it's one of the best ones. We actually got word the today... That it passed 800 million sold, I believe. Which is... Or, sorry, um, 800 million, not not units, sorry. Dollars. Jesus. Sorry about that. So, this is the biggest launch since Modern Warfare 3 in 2011. And that's tremendous for the game. It's a big deal. Uh, I think it paints a picture on Call of Duty's continued dominance in this, in this industry. And I think rightfully so. If you play this game and you're looking for a tight incredible FPS experience. It's what you're going to find here. I think the uh, single player was great. I'm pretty new into the multiplayer. I'm only like level 20. I'm enjoying myself. I like the new system that they're using that if you use different guns, you'll unlock 
parts for other guns so like for instance if you want a specific foregrip on your m4 that's only unlocked if you use the p90 and it gets to level eight or you know and that is expounded upon with every game uh, every gun in the game so if you want all the attachments for every gun in the game you have to actually kind of use every gun in the game to a certain point i kind of like that because it kind of gives you something to strive for whereas you find yourself like oh i've hit max level on all the guns i like well i guess i can go and use the p90 you might find that you like the gun now and you found a new love for it and it challenges you to experiment where i found myself losing that experimentation that i used to do as a kid in the newer modern warfare is mainly because you do the thing where you hear about what the best gun is then you use it you you get it to max level you put all the good stuff on it use it you love it gets nerfed then this the gun's the new one level that you know and that happens twenty thousand times until the, the new one comes out and I like this system as because I can use different guns throughout my time with the game and find that I'm always getting progression in some instances as long as I'm using these guns. And it's very fun. I love the shotgun, by the way. The M4 feels nice. Shotgun feels nice. Can't wait to start using more guns. I, I'm going to start upgrading. I'm upgrading actually the f tac so I can get the Hurricane, which is like a M4 submachine gun variation of it. And I, I very much like that. I like that you can change the receivers. I, I just love the gunsmith in this game. It's very, it's very nice. I think that's all really of what I've been playing. I'm more Overwatch 2. I'm fully addicted to that game. It is incredible. Just simply incredible game. I'm enjoying my time with it. I am playing competitive. I am terrible, I feel like. I was able to get the gold on my support classes, which if you don't know that, that's like the competitive side of the game. So the better you do, the higher you rank. There's, you know, bronze, gold, so like it goes up to like you're like top 500 in your region and crazy stuff like that and i was playing overwatch 2 just you know more overwatch that's i don't really think i have anything to add i've actually been going for the achievements in junkenstein's revenge uh it's it's a pve activity that they add every halloween they actually added a new one i called wrath of the bride i think or, or something i think it's called and that one was really fun too although I've been playing more of Revenge so I can get all the achievements for that because you have to play them in different modes that they provide. And I've done uh, all of the different modes. So that was nice to to do. And I've actually been on a kind of achievement kick these last few weeks as I finally cracked, I um, want to say like 280,000 gamer score. I'm real proud about that. But that's enough about what I've been playing. Let's start with the show. Rumor Roundup. <laughs> New hiring position at Night Dog seems to suggest that the upcoming online game factions will be free to play. Now, upon revising, I actually wrote this up. Now, that doesn't quite make sense now that I read it out loud as that game is already done. So it wouldn't quite make too much sense that they would be getting a uh, role for the factions mode uh, that's already finished. Because factions is done. It's, it's seemingly probably they're probably polishing it right now. It's probably set to release. I highly doubt they'll be adding a... Uh, what was the role again? We're looking for a live ops producer to support our major new multiplayer title. We're looking for the right candidate to get in early and help define the processes, requirements, and infrastructure that will support the project through launch and beyond. In this role, you'll have a significant impact on the way we work, both within the game team and production team, by leveling up the skills we will apply to the production of our games as well as the structures we work within on the games team side you'll partner with producers leads and directors to understand their needs and develop process to involve improved communication scheduling and overall quality of life people relationships with our partners at sony gather data with the blah, 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 blah. so they're looking for a producer and said literally says get in early so this is for their new role and i don't quite no here let's read the requirements and we can kind of maybe garner what the game is proven experience in a production or project uh management role where you've supported updates to a live title or project solid understanding of video game development software development processes and project management practices knowledge knowledgeable in common production methodologies agile waterfall as well as software strong organizational skills self-starter approach challenges creatively Bonus skills, proven experience in a projection role supporting a AAA free-to-play live title. Experience in customer support, player support, or community management. Experience working with networking, server, or online processes. I find it 
hard to believe that it would be for that because it's so close to being launched. They wouldn't really need this, and it literally does say get in early. Now, maybe I am incorrect here, and it really is for the upcoming Factions game that will launch. I'm not sure. We're, I'm going to really mold on this and see if I can find some more stuff for the next recording of the show to see if I can really figure out what this is. I, I don't... I don't no, is this for a new title that they're going to be working on? Is it just factions and they just need a new live ops producer? Seems a little late in the game to, to need to, to be hiring for that, but maybe it is. And I'm just thinking way too hard on it. I don't know. According to a known insider, Rythian, Sony has approached CD Projekt Red about acquiring them multiple times. He points to the reason CD Projekt Red unveiled their long lineup of games recently was to boost their stock before talk about an acquisition from either Sony or others. Now, I don't know this individual, so I'm not going to put my name on anything that this man is necessarily saying, although I don't, I find it, I don't, how do I word this? So, Sony approaching CG Project Red at some point about acquiring them is not a crazy thing to say. Uh, they have whole divisions that kind of go around and just talk to people. It doesn't have to be serious. It, every now and then, you know, they get a call from someone and says, hey, how much are you valued? Or, you know, how much would it cost to do X, Y, Z? And then they're just they're just feeling things out. So I don't think the that is a crazy thing to say. Now, is Sony approached him seriously and, and really sat down and asked, like, hey, how much? We really are interested in this, and we actually have a open checkbook for this. So what's going on? And if a partner you go into and they immediately go, okay, well, we're worth this, and maybe they said, well, that's way too much, and they're like, well... Let's boost our stock to try and get a higher um, uh, estimation. Then let's do it. And that's probably what they did. Here, I wouldn't be shocked if it was not only Sony, though, as I find that on the back of the industry that we find ourselves in currently, where acquisitions are just prevalent everywhere right now, and we're finding ourselves um, in the position of... There's a lot of companies that want to buy now because uh, of the pending interest rates. Now, I'm not an economist, or I don't know a lot about the economy, but I do know that inflation is only going to get worse. So if you are going to buy something, you need to do it now because the same product that you buy, even at the same value, will be more money in three years than now, most likely. Or, f or five years, or maybe even next year. We don't know how bad inflation is going to get. I think we had our highest inflation rate a couple months ago of like 10% or something. So like our money is losing value. So if this company is sitting there, they have their accountant sitting down. It's like, Hey, if we're going to buy someone, we need to do it right now. So maybe Sony is walking around like, Hey, we got to burn this cash because we are going to be paying 20% more for this for no other reason. If we wait any longer or, you know, any, anything can really possible with this kind of thing. So, I thought it was interesting to bring it forward. Let's move on. Visual Arts may be getting their own studio, which are behind all the motion capture, scanning, and etc. for a lot of PlayStation games. And of course, most obvious to know is Last of Us Part 1. Now, I want to read a little bit more about this. This, is gonna, this was a post from Reset Era. And it was found by someone named uh, Costa Curtis. I believe I'm saying that correctly. Now, Visual Arts... And I believe this is actually going to be for a new role or a new, a full new studio. And I think they're actually going to be called because Naughty Dog is actually um, working with them. Sony, uh, let's actually read. What is this? Oh, that is the. Oh, yeah. And it was found by a listing. So let's read this post. Sony PlayStation is building a new internal game development team in partnership with. Uh, Visual Arts, an award-winning full production group that specializes in animation, motion capture, cinematic, cinematic arts, and scanning. This is the same world-class team known for its contribution to the Last of Us franchise. The high-visibility project is being developed in collaboration with Naughty Dog. Though currently unannounced, we have a clear vision and plan to release. Using our existing expertise and premier talent, we will guarantee a high visual quality bar for the game and a compelling experience for our players. Our team is seeking a dedicated, focused, and self-motivated producer. With a broad, proven experience with a track record of building processes to help team achieve its highest potential as the ideal candidate, you will be 
prospect in all aspects of AAA game product and management. You are an organized, attentive leader, strategy, blah, 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 blah. So that is for a senior producer role for uh, Sony, and it is going to be for a new internal group in partnership with Visual Arts. Might even be called, because I think um, they actually worked with Last of Us Part 1, and they were actually apparently jokingly called Naughty Dog South or something like that, similar to what happened with Sony Bend. So that might be happening. Maybe Naughty Dog is getting a full-on separate location, and that will be how Naughty Dog expands, and they might be working on a new game. Because if they're going to be working on a team, they need a new game, maybe it's Uncharted. Maybe we find themselves revisiting the Uncharted franchise. I would love that, but... I find them kind of done with that series, so I really don't see it happening. And honestly, I I would be a little scared if they brought back Uncharted because, although Factions, maybe hopefully Factions is a one off, but if they bring back Uncharted, I'm very scared that it is going to be a Games of the Service title. But Naughty Dog can do literally whatever they want. So if they wanted to do that, I guess I would believe in them regardless. So I don't know, but. Hopefully, I would love to see a new Uncharted game because that's really... It's either they have three options, right? Last of Us, Uncharted, or a new IP. I think Naughty Dog proper is obviously making a new one. Last of Us, I think. I think they're working on Last of Us Part 3 right now. Um, I would not be shocked. Of course, they're working on Factions mainly, but I think pre-production right now is probably Last of Us Part 3. And then they're going to be done with that series. It wouldn't be crazy for them to go back to Uncharted after that's done, or maybe I'm having my dates backwards. Maybe Factions comes, they go to Uncharted, and they do something. Maybe they remake Uncharted 1. I don't know. Or they go and make a new Uncharted game. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but whatever they do, I will be interested, because Naughty Dog has made that a reality. We had some reports from sources at Riot that said Xbox has escalated efforts to try and get a Genshin Impact-like game going on their platform. They are also aggressively seeking talent in China to try and find a game that can rival Genshin's impact on the industry. So it looks like they're actually, Xbox is kind of desperate for a game right now. Similar to Genshin Impact, they want that kind of gotcha-like formula going on their platform. I'm curious, uh, of course, one of these big three want to have a Fortnite, Genshin Impact, Apex, or whatever, that they can call their own so they can reap 100% of the profits out of it. Now, what's good about getting um, all of this working on their own is they're getting all this money regardless from Fortnite, Apex Legends, things of that nature anyways, so they don't have to do anything. It's just passive income, but why not have your own title that you will get 100% of profits if you're able to nail the drug-like induced uh, compulsion that these games kind of demand. Games like Genshin Impact, games like uh, Apex Legends, overall, the people that find themselves coming back to and just spending more and more money on. And you can kind of guarantee a, a long-lasting revenue stream versus a we released a game and we made a lot of money once. And I think that's just what Microsoft's trying to find. I don't think there was too much crazy stuff here. I I, I was reading about it. it. It really, I didn't find too much stuff in string. Yeah, Microsoft wants to make a game like Engine Impact to make a lot of money. I don't think that's a little shocking at all. I did find it more interesting that they're trying to find talent in China specifically to see if they can get in early. I, I, I assume that's what they're trying to do. But I think Xbox is so global that they're just doing that around the world. I don't think that's... Uh, specific to this necessarily, but we'll have to see. And that's the end of Rumor Roundup. Let's start the show. PlayStation London, known for being on the newest tech coming from PlayStation in terms of peripheral gaming, uh, PlayStation Studios, and for making games like the SingStar franchise and Blood and Truth on PlayStation VR, announced a new game, unlike others in their past. It is currently an untitled co-op combat game set in a fantasy London reports game is just up is detailing their experience with the, making this game. They know their hair just stems from working with the newest peripherals and utilizing VR in their recent years. And co of the studio, Stuart White, said this, quote, innovation is always going to be at the heart of what we do. If you look at our heritage and the titles we've done, there are a lot of firsts in there and that will continue. The other co-editor of the studio added, quote, What's great about the heritage is the problem-solving aspect. We have taken different technologies and looked at how we shift the games industry. 
and come up with concepts that haven't been there and done before. That here just means that team is comfortable throwing themselves outside of their comfort zone. Even though we're not working on something that uses all different bits of bits of peripherals, it is still about taking that DNA of innovation and putting it into our game concepts. A couple other notes as they seem to be sticking to oh end quote, sorry. And a couple other notes as they seem to be sticking into their in-house engine Soho. Even though their upcoming game won't be VR, they'll be utilizing some of their tech they had to use in the game. Now, I apologize. I did not list the um, second co-head, so let me grab her name really quick. I could have swore I had it at the end of that quote. I must have forgot. Her name is... And I'll, and I'll bring up this image. They actually have a very interesting image here, but um, it does look pretty cool. As a Fantasy London sounds very, very interesting to me, at least. Let's see here. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Tara Sanders. Apologies for forgetting about that. But let's bring up the image really quick of the game. Boom, there. And of course, written by Christopher Drang. You can see his name right there. Let me get that image right there. Boom. Boom. So if you're looking on YouTube, you can actually look. I'll describe it to audio listeners. It's, it's a Fantasy London. You can see a dragon. You can see a lot of people kind of... You can see like maybe a character that you'd be playing as kind of like in a judo like stance for like charging a plow or maybe she's using and, and there's like a three platforms being made and someone's jumping and it looks like about to hit the dragon with some sort of energy punch or something but the game looks cool it's new it doesn't really mean anything because we're just so early i just wanted to bring this to everyone's attention as sony london just came out and said some stuff and i i always like when we get that we get, you know we get the movie like industry where they're so open with talking with things like sony lynn just came out and was like hey we're making this probably won't see it for a while but this is the concept art that we made and it looks cool and i hope this is a continue i think we're seeing a lot we're, we're seeing more and more of this where industry um veterans and big name studios are coming out and being like hey this is what we're making we saw that with um uh control developers quantum break fucking god damn it i'm blanking on the name i apologize um but we saw that with the control devs remedy studios there we go. there we go remedy that they announced all their projects they were fully open with that when they pretty much started production of what they were working on which is very cool we saw that uh, as well with um uh, was it Team Ninja? Yeah, they're pretty open with their stuff too. So like we're seeing more studios just kind of tell you what they're working on. I find that very interesting. And I like that. I, I like that we're getting a more movie-like games industry here. Where we're just talking about our stuff. We have some news from Rocksteady here. I'm going to read a message that they post because I feel like that will... I feel like that is the most informative way of bringing you the news. So this is what they posted. I have some important news to share with you about Rocksteady Studios. Co-founders and studio heads Sefton Hill and Jamie Walker have made the decision to leave the studio. We are very proud to have worked alongside Jamie and Sefton, who have led their talented teams to create some of the best games in the world. From the criminally... Sorry. From the critically acclaimed hit Batman Arkham franchise to their evolutionary thinking with Suicide Squad, They've been great leaders of the team. Visiting Rocksteady, or sorry, visiting Rocksteady Studios have always been a highlight for me personally. The attention to detail, the energy of the people, and a sense of what it is like to be in a high-performing studio. They have committed to the highest quality of excellence across all facets of game development while ensuring an outstanding culture of caring for their employees. With Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League nearly finished, they have both decided to leave Rocksteady at the end of 2022 and will begin a new adventure in gaming. We have the utmost respect and gratitude for Jamie and Sefton and wish them all the best in their new endeavor. Like many fans, we look forward to what they do next. Rocksteady is very well positioned with veteran studio leadership being elevated to oversee the team. We're extremely pleased to announce that Nathan Burlo, longtime Rocksteady director of production and originally founding member of the studio, will step into the role of studio director and Darius Sediguan. Sediguan will take the reins as studio product director. Nathan and Darius are extremely talented executives. And they are passionate about continuing the high-quality game development of Rocksteady for Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, and all future games. Now, usually I sound the alarm bells. 
with studio heads leaving um, right during a production. Now, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is probably done. Not probably. It definitely is done. It's playable from start to finish. They're probably polishing it right now. They're probably looking it over. They're not really probably changing anything insane. They're probably looking it over, probably seeing what they need to cut or what they need to keep or what needs to be like enhanced and just looking at the overall game. They're not leaving immediately. This is There's no dramatic leave. They said they are leaving at the end of 2022, so they'll still have their names on this game because this game launches in a few months after that. So I don't think this is anything to really snuff about. I don't think anything crazy is happening here. So we'll have to see if... If if it was an issue with the game, he would have already left by now. This isn't like a situation where I would bring up like like Bioware losing all of their talent, right? Something clearly was wrong there, so they all left, right? So this situation's I think a little different as the game is nearly done. They're not leaving immediately. They're leaving at the end of this year, and they're well millionaires, right? They've made so much money. They've been there. They're they're the founding, like they made the Arkham Asylum. I forget what other games they made, but they made Arkham Asylum. I think they were bought right after that. I think they were. I'm pretty sure they were bought after Asylum, and before City, by WB. And then, they've just been coasting. They probably made a huge chunk of money from that acquisition. They were probably hundreds of millionaires easily from that uh, purchase. If they invested wisely, they've kept that money pretty much. And they're about to go and probably do it again. They're going to go make another rock city. They're going to go do a Callisto Protocol with Striking Distance. They're going to go, uh, sorry, opposite. They're going to go do Striking Distance and make a Callisto Protocol. They're just going to go leave, make a new studio probably, and then make a new game and do it again. Make another $100 million, $200, $500 million easily. So good for them. I, I'm excited. They made a great, great studio. I would have. A few years ago, I would have said one of the best studios. I think it's just been too long since we've seen them for me to keep saying that. Because they made three incredible games, but that's that's it for a long time. They, they pretty much missed a whole generation of consoles. So I would like to see what they're doing. Because it's been a bit too long for me to keep screaming how great they are. Oh, one second. Cheers. Sorry about that. In a recent Wall Street Journal event, Phil Spencer had some answers to a few interesting questions, mainly if the price of Xbox products will be raised. He stated frankly, quote, I do think at some point we'll have to raise the prices on certain things. But going to this holiday, we thought it was important to maintain the prices, end quote. I mean, he's just telling you. Yes, it will. But not right now, though. So, what? he didn't specify what? He didn't specify what things are going to be, if it's just Game Pass, if it's just the systems, if it's controllers, if it's all of it. Who knows? But Phil Spencer told you right now, we will be raising the prices of everything pretty soon. Will it be just in the Americas? Will it be everywhere? Will it be just like PlayStation where everything else is more expensive except in America because that's where they need the most money? Who knows? We'll have to see. But... Phil Spencer himself told you everything will be more expensive very soon. So, get ready for that. I hope it's nothing too drastic, as I know everyone's experiencing, and I am too, the uh, increasing inflation that is killing my wallet. I'm sure it's killing a lot of people at home wallet too. But let's move on, because I don't think we have too much else to say. I wouldn't be shocked if Game Pass gets a little more expensive, although that that's like their main thing they're trying to push, but... I think it's time. I think I think they're looking at Game Pass being like, all right, let's raise five dollars and make some money now. Who knows? Phil Spencer also noted that Game Pass is profitable for Xbox and it is somewhere around ten to fifteen percent of their revenue. He also stated that Xbox Game Pass has slowed down and even stated, "quote We're seeing incredible growth on PC. On console, I've seen growth slow down mainly because at some point you've reached everybody on console that wants to subscribe." End quote. Microsoft just revealed that it saw PS Game Pass uh, subscriptions increase by 159% year over year. 
and that more than 20 million people have streamed games on Xbox Cloud Gaming, up from 10 million earlier this year. Now, I do want to note a couple things with this. We did learn today that they're doing a promotion with Twitch. That if you... Uh, during a certain period, I, I forget which, but if you like gift subs on Twitch, you will be uh, given PC Game Pass stuff. So... One second, achievers. I'll be right back. This this will be cut out of the video. I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. We were talking about Twitch. Yes. There were gifting subs. You get PC Game Pass. That's going to try and boost numbers more. See if they can retain any of those people. Now, let's talk about Game Pass on console here. I've seen growth slow down. Mainly because at some point, you've reached everyone on console. That wants to subscribe. Clearly, right? You're not going to get every person that buys an Xbox subscribe to Game Pass for a lot of reasons. One, not everyone buys a system and uses it enough to warrant Game Pass. A lot of them just don't want it and they want to own their games. And a lot of people buy it and sell their consoles or never use it. So, you just it's just impossible. So, at some point, yes, you will see a slick little down effect. I want to actually go back to him saying that Game Pass is profitable for Xbox, which I think a lot of people have been trying to say that. I just do not think that's true. I, I think that is just not true. Um, I think Game Pass has been very good at retaining the very hardcore in the Xbox community. I think Game Pass has done very well. <sighs> Let me back up because I feel like I'm going to fuck this up if I say it any differently. Game Pass has done very well at retaining the most hardcore to continue to play and buy on Xbox. But there is a subsect of that Game Pass number. It's probably a pretty large percentage that only now pay for Game Pass and do not buy games. That isn't good. You do not want that. You want actually Game Pass to be a boost to everything around it and not a I have Game Pass therefore I don't need to buy anything because then you are only getting $10 a month from everybody every month for a year which sounds really nice on paper but in practice is not enough money to sustain the large money sink that Game Pass is they are paying millions of dollars for a lot of these games to be on the platform to begin with they have to make Halo. They have to make Gears, which are hundreds of millions of dollars to make. Like Gears, the new Gears game will probably be $300 million easily. I mean, just easily. $300 million bucks to, to make, probably, from start to finish. From pre-pro to game has launched, $300 million easily. If we have 20 million people on Game Pass, which I think is more than it is right now. I, I can't quite remember. It might be a little less. But let's say that's 20 million people on Game Pass for a year. So you're getting 20 million on Game Pass every year. So 10 times, uh, 10 times 12, 120, 120 times 20 million is about a billion dollars, a little over a billion dollars for a year. So let me make sure I'm doing the math right. Yeah. Should be a billion dollars a year if you're getting. 20 million people signed up on Game Pass, which is a lot of fucking people. You're getting $10 a month from them. 120 times the 20 million, yeah. Yeah, and that would have to be every month, which I doubt happens. That'd be like a billion bucks. Sounds like a lot of money, but when you look at all of the deals they have to do, when you look at they're not making any additional money on that Gears because no one's buying it, they just have Game Pass. Right? We're not seeing a lot of these Xbox games on the MPDs for a reason because they're not buying them. They're used to, you, you know, you have Game Pass. Why would you buy it? Why would you? Why would you buy a game if it's on Game Pass? So they're only getting that money from Game Pass. So they're eating their cost in two ways. They have to make the game, they have to market the game, 
And actually, a third way. They have to maintain Game Pass in other ways other than just Xbox games being added to the platform. And I find it's just hard to believe that that's profitable. I, I don't think that's happening. Maybe it is, and I'm just missing a, a key piece of the puzzle. And also, my math might be just fucking wrong, because I feel like it is definitely wrong. 20 times 110, 24. No, it's like 2.4, right? Billion? I'm right here. I don't know. Anyways. At max, it's $900 million. Something like that. So, like, it's just not, it's not working. I do think Game Pass is good. If it only included Xbox games, probably. And there would be some way to probably do that. Like, make it $20 every year. You get every Xbox game. I think that's really good. That's a really good value proposition. It's just... When you're paying ten dollars and you're getting like a hundred games, you're getting games like Outriders when they come out. You're getting games like Signalist. They like they're paying millions of dollars for these games. So like, I just the math isn't there for it to be worth it, right? I don't know. This is one of the things where I just wanted to point everyone's attention to it. Uh, this is over in your gamer. It's called Why the Return of 30 Frames Per Second Games is Inevitable. This is by Richard Leadbetter. Now, he is he's at Digital Foundry, and he is pretty smart with tech stuff. I wanted, everyone, uh, I wanted to point everyone, just go give it a read. I'm not going to cover pretty much anything from this story because I think it's just a really good read, and it had me learn a lot about stuff. And it opened my eyes in a few ways, and I think people should go check it out and see what they think of the article and maybe uh and tweet at me if you want to talk about it we can definitely talk about this article but i think it was a very interesting read i found myself questioning a couple of previous notions that i had about this um generation of systems but i don't know i, I want everyone's thoughts on this as i thought <laughs> this was going to be the end of 30 frames personally um, aside from like one-off games, maybe like a platformer or something like you know that was cheap, like some indie game that couldn't afford to be sixty, which is fine. I you know, like like things like that. I don't care. But I thought we were done, and I thought everything was gonna be sixty. And it seems like I have another thing to think. Now, before we get into that next story, let me get a sip of water, and then we're gonna start. <sighs> Ooh, sorry about that. <clears throat> talking for a minute. All right. Electronic Arts strikes three game deal with Marvel. This is over at Bloomberg. I found this as I was recording, so I couldn't write, do a write up. I apologize. Um, go read this. is by Lucas Shaw. Now, they did do a PR release about this, so um, I don't feel too, too bad about reading a lot of this. So. Electron Arcs will develop three video games inspired by Marvel comic book characters after forging a deal that gives the company access to the most popular entertainment franchise in the world. The first game EA is making is based on Iron Man, a billionaire inventor superhero uh, who has a subject of one of his first hit Marvel movies it announced in September. The Redwood City, California-based developer plans to create a single-player action-adventure game for PCs and consoles that features an original story based on Iron Man's history. EA didn't provide details about other characters that plan to use or give a release timetable. We do know that the second one is going to be a Black Panther game. Um, that is actually the game Jeff Grubb leaked a long time ago. And they have not mentioned since then for obvious reasons because they can't announce it yet. But Iron Man is guaranteed now. They have a three game deal. The third one is unknown. Even Jeff Grubb said it is unknown as it is in pre-production and it will be changed probably 20 times. So there's no point in reporting it. Because who knows what's final yet. I wanted to bring this to everyone's attention as this is now final in, in form. Thank God it is not a yearly deal or anything like that. It's just they signed a deal with uh, LucasArts to make a three games together. That's fine. Their previous deal with like a Star Wars like deal was terrible for the industry in multiple ways. So I'm glad that's still over with and we're just getting, hey, you get three games. You don't get like exclusivity because you'll just fuck everything up. Uh, but I'm excited. We'll have to see um, what this is going to be. I can't be excited for games that we don't see anything out anymore just because I'm I'm talking about them all the time now. So it's like, I'll just have to wait to, to, to see, right? Uh, it's motive. 
uh, making this game. So, you know, of course, they were uh, uh, the people behind Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, he's led by Oliver Prolix, which worked on Guardians of the Galaxy. And that's the news for the week. Let's go into day updates. Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition confirmed for Xbox on January 31st. Age of Empires 4 is coming, going to be coming to Xbox in 2023. So that's actually kind of a big deal. Everyone assumed that that was not coming to Xbox. Um, they did mention that they were working on a console port, and it looks like it's actually going to be coming. So get excited. If you are an Age of Empires fan, if you don't know what that is, it's a civilization-like game, strategy, you make an empire and things, and you kill people. Now it is Game Pass Day, November 1st, so we have to be talking about Game Pass stuff. Legend of Tiendig, cl a cloud console PC that's available day one on Game Pass. Walking Dead, a new frontier, the complete season is going to be on PC, and Walking Dead Michonne, the complete season is going to be on PC. These are all games coming soon. Ghost Song Cloud Console and PC, November 3rd. That's a day one Game Pass game. And Football Manager 2023 on PC, November 8th. That's going to be available day one on PC Game Pass. Football Manager 2023 on console. This is Cloud Console and PC, November 8th. This is available day one on Game Pass game. And a game I am incredibly excited for, Return to Monkey Island. Cloud Console and PC is going to be coming November 8th. I cannot wait for this game. Very excited. And... A second thing I am very excited for these these are going to be three three great days. Although we and we have God of War mixed between one of this, so I will have be very busy with these games. Vampire Survivors is coming to console on November tenth. It's already on PC Game Pass, so now it's also going to be coming to consoles November tenth. Very exciting! I heard this game is very good. I actually downloaded it on my PC. I did not know it was going to be coming to console so soon. So I'll be playing it on my console and. Pentiment Cloud Console and PC November 15th, available day one on Game Pass. This is from Obsidian, of course. They had a small team divert themselves from the other project they were working on, Overworld, Outer Worlds 2. Um, and dis and uh not disavowed, it's avowed. Uh they had a small team uh aside from that, just making something for fun, and this is what they made. They made like a choose your own not really choose your own adventure, but it's like I mean, I guess it kind of is. It's it's it looks like a choose your own adventure mixed with like a point and click, mixed with like a mystery. Like I don't know. Watch the trailer if you want more. But it looks very cool, and I'm excited that we don't know too much about the game. I'll be trying it. Now the game I'm excited for. This is a great uh, month for Game Pass. Somerville console and PC November fifteenth available day one in Game Pass. I'm actually gonna read this one because it looks very interesting. In the wake of an otherworldly invasion that's left the world in catastrophe, you must find the means to make your family whole again. Explore a rich and atmospheric world along with the in intimate repercussions of large scale conflict in a handcrafted sci-fi narrative experience set across a perilous rural landscape. Very excited. We saw this, I believe, like at some showcase like a year or two ago. Now we're going to be going over what's leaving soon. Now remember, you have to buy all these games before they leave to save 20% off. And these are all leaving November 8th, these two games. Football Manager 2022 on both Xbox and PC. Cloud Console and PC as well. So, November 8th, those are all gone. And everything leaving November 15th. Art of the Rally. Fae Tactics, Next Space Rebel, Once Step from Eden, Superland, all of those games are leaving from cloud, console, and PC Game Pass. And that is everything on Date Update. Now let's talk about what do I have keyed up for the week. That, of course, could be a manga, book, comic book, podcast, maybe music, TV show, movie, who knows? What do I have keyed up this week? And, of course, this is not only for question for me that's everyone at home what are you going to be playing over the weekend what are your thoughts on the news that we covered this week anything i'll mention on the show of course comment below or go to patreon.com slash achievers support us there and ask us any questions privately and i answer them all i also answer every youtube comment as well now what do i have queued up this week uh more of the same everything i mentioned at the beginning i'm going to be playing this at the end uh, at, the, at the end of this week i'll be playing more call of duty I will be playing um, and finishing Plague's Tale. I am trying and desperately hoping that I can finish Plague Tale before uh, anything else comes out. Uh, mainly God of War. I would love to finish Plague's Tale 100% and 
before God of War Ragnarok comes out because if it if I don't, I might not be returning to the game. So I have to I have to play and finish it. Um, we're getting close to the end of the year. Um, top ten very soon. I'll be making my list right now, just so I can have that month to two month window of just really thinking about it, really sitting down and just really thinking about it, seeing what I would like to decide on. What is gonna be on my top 10 but um enough about me what's gonna be on your top 10 for the year what are a couple games that shocked you i'm going to be trying to play signalist as well before the end of the year because i heard fantastic things mainly from people that i know very well that have good taste that said the game's actually very good which is good i was looking for a game like when i saw it for the first time i was very much hoping it was going to be great and it looks like it's going to so very excited for that and that's gonna be it for me for this week this was the solo episode i will not be solo next week so be excited i won't say the guests though just in case something happens i don't want uh, any pressure on them but uh until the next time achievers go achieve